All right, this is chapter three of The Dreamer by Pam Yunus Ryan. Mud. Blip, blip, blop. Oip, 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 oip. Tin, 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 tin. For a month, the clouds spilled. Mountains slid into valleys, houses wallowed in shallow lakes, and the rocks and dirt that held fast to the train tracks disappeared. Father prepared to leave for work, to repair the railroad, and would be gone for several weeks. From a window, Neftali and Rodolfo watched him walk from the house to the platform to wait for the train. As the workers arrived, they huddled around him. Father does not have a sour face t -t today, said Neftali. He looks happy and nice. He is happy, said Rodolfo. He's the boss and everyone must follow his orders. But they l -l like him, said Neftali. See how he jokes and the men laugh? Rodolfo shook his head. You would laugh at his jokes too if you needed your job. Father has m -m -m many friends, insisted Neftali. When he's home, our table is always crowded. Ah, yes, the great Jose Reyes. The more people at his table, the more important he feels. But he passes out invitations like overripe plums. Rodolfo's face twisted with disgust. Better for us if he stays in the forest. Why? Neftali, are you not miserable? Rodolfo held up one hand and began tapping each finger in sequence. We cannot sit in the salon. We cannot eat unless our hands have been scrubbed raw. We cannot make noise. We cannot sing. We must think as he thinks. Rodolfo's shoulders shed, sagged. We can only be what he wants. Even the madre is a servant in his presence. We're all at his mercy. And as you get older, it gets worse. No, no, it will not get worse because I will not be stubborn like you. You think it is my fault? And that if you're obedient, you will grow up to be his pride and joy? Rodolfo smirked. Buena suerte. Good luck to that. When you are my age, you will see. Outside, the whistle blew and the train pulled away. The boys watched until the caboose disappeared into the leafy cavern. I wish I could go into the forest, said Neftali. It is a long ride and not that much fun, said Rodolfo. Why are you so eager? I want to see everything, said Neftali. The tall pines and parrots and beetles and eagles. And father says there is a bird in the forest that tells the future. Rodolfo nodded. The chacao bird. If you hear it call on your right side, it is a good omen and means fortune and happiness. If you hear it call on your left, it is a warning and means bad luck and disappointment. They say the chacao bird does not lie. You will hear it before you ever see it, though. It's a very shy bird. I want to see the chacao bird, and I want to see the other father, then in a nice one. Rodolfo shook his head, then walked from the room. Naftali whispered, I want to see everything. The days became weeks. The relentless rain forced everyone to stay indoors, and the mud prevented any wagon from maneuvering the streets. Eventually, Uncle Orlando could not get to his office, so he came to Naftali's house to write his newspaper articles at the kitchen table. Uncle Orlando was Madre's younger brother and a taller version of her with the same wide face and brown puppy-like eyes. Naftali loved to watch him work. He set up his own workplace at the table next to his uncle, imitating everything he did. While Uncle Orlando wrote, Naftali copied words from books. If Uncle Orlando looked up a word in the dictionary, Naftali did the same. When Uncle Orlando tucked his pencil behind his ear, rose from the table, and paced back and forth, Naftali shadowed him. The rain did not surrender, and neither did Naftali. On the fourth afternoon of Uncle Orlando's stay, Larita played with her dolls on the kitchen floor. Rodolfo hummed as he did his homework, and Mamadre made potato turnovers for dinner. At one end of the table, amid his papers and books, Uncle Orlando wrote. Neftali stood next to him, leaning closer and closer. Nephew, I'm not sure there is room for both of us in this chair unless you sit in my lap. Are you going to watch me write every single sentence? asked Uncle Orlando. Neftali put his finger on Uncle Orlando's paper. What is that word? That word is Mapuche. They are the indigenous people who live in Aracania, our neighbors. Natalie scooted his own piece of paper closer and copied the word. I suppose that if this keeps up, I will have to make you my partner someday. Natalie smiled and nodded, nodded vigorously. Well then, if you're going to assist me in my work, I will need to adjust to the sound of your annoying breathing. Uncle Orlando reached over and pulled Natalie into his lap, tickling and wrestling with him. Soon they were rolling on the floor. Rodolfo jumped up and pounced on them. Lorita squealed as they moved dangerously close to her dolls. The boys tumbled apart, laughing. 
Mamadre stood with her hands on her hips. I see that the dreariness of the rain has made us all need a diversion, she said. Enough of sitting in this one room. Come, I will read to you in the salon. But, but, but we are n n not allowed in the salon, Natalie reminded her. Mamadre smiled and raised her eyebrows. Today, you are allowed. While Mamadre and Uncle Orlando made hot chocolate, Natalie and Lorita and even Rodolfo giggled as they dragged blankets from their rooms to the salon. Soon they were all snuggled beneath the blankets and sipping the warm drinks. Mamadre picked up a book, cleared her throat, and began a story, transporting them to a land of elves and princesses. When the story ended, Lorita flung off her coverlet, jumped up, and skipped in a circle. I am a princess! I am a princess! Rodolfo teased, you do not look like a princess. Uncle Orlando looked at Mamadre. No, she does not. Can we do something about that? So Mamadre smiled, rose from her chair, and kneeled at the giant brass fitted trunk strapped with oak. None of them had ever seen the contents of the trunk. Naftali looked at Rodolfo, who smiled and shrugged. Larita pressed her hands over her mouth in anticipation. Mamadre lifted the heavy, curved lid. The smell of musty clothes and cedar drew Naftali closer. Mamadre took out a stack of folded dresses, a wool coat, and a fur hat, which she handed to Naftali. Further down, Mamadre found a lace petticoat and a filmy scarf. Lorita quickly pulled the petticoat over her clothes. As she twirled around, Mamadre lifted out a guitar. Uncle Orlando retrieved it and began to tighten the end to the strings. Mamadre found a top hat, which she presented to Rodolfo. While Mamadre tied Lorita's scarf, Naftali stepped to the trunk. He peered over the edge. At the bottom, he saw a bundle of letters and postcards tied with a satin ribbon. How many words had been saved inside? He leaned forward, reached down, grabbed the bundle, and fell in head first. Mamadre spun, Naftali! His, voice mum came, his muffled voice came from the bottom of the trunk. I am here. When Uncle Orlando lifted him up and set him on the sofa, Naftali still held the bundle. Each letter had been opened from the top of the envelope and the flap still sealed with wax and stamped with the impression of a heart. On the top letter, someone had written the word love above the seal. Mamadre took the bundle from him, put it back inside, and carefully closed the trunk. Naftali, the lid could have fallen on your head or your hands, and for what? Some old letters and cards from relatives we don't even know? Promise me you will never open this trunk. Naftali looked wistfully toward it. I p -p promise. Uncle Orlando strummed the guitar. Naftali, come sit, stand next to me as my partner. How do you think we should proceed? Naftali looked up. With a song? My sentiments exactly, he said, propping one foot on a chair and the guitar on his knee. Rodolfo, will you honor us? No one in the family can sing as you can. He began to play. Rodolfo hesitated and looked from Mamadre to Uncle Orlando for reassurance. Your father is not here, Rodolfo, and it would be a favor to me. Rodolfo turned back to Mamadre. She nodded. Something deep inside of Naftali wanted Rodolfo to sing at the top of his lungs. He clapped wildly. Ye -ye yes, he said. Rodolfo smiled and put on the top hat. He began softly at first. Liviamo, liviamo nelietti calafice, aviesa in fiore. Let us drink from the goblets of joy adorned with beauty. He stopped and looked to each of them for reassurance. Uncle Orlando nodded. Continue, I know the song from La Travietta. But sing louder and faster, it's a song of great spirit. He strummed the opening chords. Rodolfo began again. Mamadre and Larita danced. Naftali stood up, tapped his foot, and clapped to the beat. Larita and Mamadre waltzed faster and faster, both of them laughing. Naftali could not take his eyes from Rodolfo's face, which had lost all traces of anger and sullenness. His voice was deep and rich and operatic. Rodolfo opened his arms wide and sang. His tenor round and full so and so beautiful that Naftali's eyes filled with tears. Uncle Orlando finished the song with several resounding chords to accompany Rodolfo's last long note. Rodolfo took off the hat and swept it in a great arc. As he bowed, Mamadre and Larita rushed to hug him. B -b Bravo! yelled Naftali. Naftali could not remember if he had ever seen Rodolfo or Larita so happy, or the last time he had heard Mamadre laugh out loud. He ran to his family and threw his arms around them, wanting this elation to last forever. But all too soon, Mamadre's body grew rigid. She raised a hand and tilted her head to one side. No one spoke as they listened for what Mamadre had heard. There it was, a faint train whistle. 
Although any number of trains pass through the Mo Tomoko every day, she always knew the sound of father's. Her smile faded. Naftali watched Rodolfo's face drain. Do not worry, Sama Madre, the train is not near. It's not yet near. Now quickly. They all scrambled. Rodolfo and Uncle Orlando replaced the contents of the trunk. Um, the contents of the trunk. Loretta hurried to collect the cups and saucers, but her hand trembled so much that a cup fell to the floor and shattered. She began to cry. Rodolfo rushed up. Rushed to her. It is all right, Loretta. You put all the blankets back to the bedrooms. I will pick up the pieces. Wide-eyed, Loretta sniffled. But, but, if father notices, I will say that I dropped it, said Naftali. She swept an arm across her tears, gave him a sweet smile, and began gathering the blankets. Meanwhile, Mamadre glided from one preparation to another. From the kitchen, for a tablecloth, to the dining room. From the cabinet, for candelabras, to the table. Attentive and methodical, she folded the napkins and set out glasses and plates without saying a word. After Natalie cleaned up the cups and saucers, he rushed to help Rodolfo and Uncle Orlando carry extra chairs to the tables. He already dreaded all of the adults who might look him in the eye and ask him questions. How m -m -m many chairs? Madre answered without looking up. Twelve at least. If Father does not bring home that many guests, he will fill every plate with strangers from the sweet street. Comb your hair. Wash your hands. I must go. I'm warm. Las Ampanadas and Elvis stay. Naftali's mouth watered at the suggestion of potato turnovers and the steak smothered with onions. He hoped they would fill up the empty feeling that had overcome him with the sound of the train whistle, the feeling that he had suddenly lost something. He watched the madre turn and walk to the kitchen, her face now wan and preoccupied. What had happened to her laughter and twinkling eyes and flushed cheeks? Where had the madre buried him? <laughs> Within the hour, Father's boots pounded on the floorboards. His big voice filled the house. Aquí estoy! I am here. He blew the conductor's whistle. Neftali, Rodolfo, and Marita rushed to stand in front of him. They held their hands flat and turned their palms up for inspection. Neftali's were still pink from his vigorous scrubbing. Satisfactory, Father nodded and then headed toward the dining room. The door opened again, and men began to flood into the house. Railroad workers, shopkeepers, and even a traveling merchant who had been waylaid overnight in Tomoko. Father poured drinks from the sideboard and assigned everyone a seat. Neftali sat in his chair with his best posture and studied his plate, avoiding any of the guest's eyes. He pushed the tablecloth aside and looked longingly underneath. If only he could escape to the shadowy company of boots. Father sat at the head of the table, jovial and generous to his guests, passing around stories as easily as he passed around El Cana Masado the homemade bread. He told tales about Percheron, er, horses, pumas in the wild, and the Mapuche Indians. What is the current situation with the Mapuche? asked the merchant. We're trying to move them out of the area, said the shopkeeper, but many will not listen. These are difficult times for those of us who are trying to develop the land and make a nice community here in Tomoko. Uncle Orlando cleared his throat. <clears throat> The Mapuche have lived here for hundreds of years. Why should they have to leave their homeland? He had a fire in his belly and a determination in his eyes. Naftali admired how his uncle never had a problem speaking out about what he thought was right or wrong. Would Naftali ever have the confidence to do the same? Their presence is undesirable, said the shopkeeper. They do not want to conform to the ways of the townspeople. The Mapuche cannot even read. The shopkeepers must put up a sign shaped like a giant shoe above the shoe store, and a sign shaped like a giant hammer above the hardware store, a giant key for the locksmith. It is absurd! And all this so that they will know which building is which? That was true, thought Naftali. He had seen those very signs. The giant shoe was his favorite. And what is wrong with that? asked Uncle Orlando. Why do we not learn a little of their language? We came to their land. Why should they think as we think? Why should they give up everything they have known for generations? Naftali considered Uncle Orlando's words. He could not imagine being pushed from his home without his books and his collections. Not to mention leaving his school in the River Katine. His eyes followed the conversation from one man to the other. Their voices grew sharper with each response. It is progress, said the shop shopkeeper. For me, it is business. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing less than greed, said Uncle Orlando. Your thinking is as thick as mud. Wait a moment, said the shopkeeper, studying Orlando, Uncle Orlando. I know who you are. You're the one who owns La Mañana, the newspaper that publishes all the articles in favor of the Mapuche. Uncle Orlando stood up. 
Naphtali's eyes grew wide with fear. The shopkeeper was much larger than Uncle Orlando. Gentlemen, this is a family dinner, said Father. We will discuss the Mapuche at a more appropriate time. Uncle Orlando sat down and folded his arms across his chest. The shopkeeper speared his meat with his fork and ate it. He chewed vigorously, his eyes darting from one person to the next. No one said a word. Mama drew rose from the table, her chair scraped the floor, breaking the uncomfortable silence. Father pointed at one of his workers. Tell the children about the beetle you, beetle you found yesterday. Until he sat up a little straighter and strained to hear. I found it on a luma tree. It looked like a living jewel wearing many fantastic colors, pink, green, purple, and silver. And when I tried to catch the thing, it zipped away. One moment it was there, and the next, poof! He nodded at Neftali. Young man, have you ever been to the forest? All eyes turned to Neftali. He knew he must answer when an adult spoke to him, but his skin felt as if it were tightening and blood rushed to do his cheeks. The word would not escape. He tried again. Father shifted in his chair, his face reddened. Do not pay attention to him. He's absent minded, and he spends too much time in the, in the idle thought that he can barely speak. There's no telling what will become of him. Naphtali sat with his eyes cast down, paralyzed. Was he breathing? He could not tell. There's nothing wrong with a little idle thought, said Uncle Orlando, and perhaps he needs the athletic outdoors and the trip to the great forest where he can focus on what is real, this beautiful land and its people, before a developer tries to change it. He glanced at Naphtali. Nephew, you would like that, would you not? Naphtali lifted his eyes slightly and nodded. Father grunted, maybe next year when he's not so feeble. He turned to Mamadre. Let us take coffee. Children, you're excused. Grateful to be released, Naphtali slid from his chair and ran to his room. There, the muffled voices of the grown-ups in the background. He paused before his collection. He straightened the rows of rocks, twigs, and nests, touching each of them as if taking attendance. Father's words echoed, absent-minded. Absent-minded. It did not make sense. How could he be absent-minded when his head was so crowded with thoughts? He opened the drawer and unfolded each piece of paper he had saved. Then he read the words, mouthing each one perfectly. Before he replaced them, he added one more, Luma. Later, as he lay in bed, Naphtali tried to imagine the beetle on the Luma tree, the one that looked like a living jewel and could disappear in the blink of an eye. Father's words haunted him. Naphtali wished the time would disappear as fast as the colorful beetle, in one poof, so he too could discover what would become of him. What is the color of a minute? A month? A year? I am poetry, lurking in dappled shadow. I am the confusion of root and gnar gnarled branch. I am the symmetry of insect, leaf, and a bird's outstretched 